What? Starting off the news this week, a study published in the journal Marine Biology has detailed the deepest ever sighting of an octopus. The discovery was made at just under 7,000 metres deep in the Indian Ocean, and the octopus that was pictured is believed to be a species of Dumbo octopus, a genus of octopuses that live in the most extreme depths of the ocean. Before this sighting, the only reliable one that was known was just over 5,000 metres down, taken off the coast of Barbados 50 years ago. It is hoped that these findings will broaden our understanding of the deep seas and dispel some misunderstandings about the true nature of creatures at such depths. Next up is an interesting paper that has suggested a new hypothesis for why diplodocid sauropods evolved such hyper-elongate tails for coordinating herding. The study explains how there's a lot of evidence for sauropods, such as diplodocids, being herding animals and that elongated tails could have enabled near-continuous physical contact between individuals. This would then increase their spatial awareness and, for example, mean that animals leading from in front could easily detect the presence of those behind by touching them with their tails, avoiding the need to turn their entire long necks around to look. It suggested that this much more efficient form of coordination would allow faster and more compacted herds to be possible, as the dinosaurs wouldn't have to continuously stop and rearrange herd formation. Certainly an intriguing idea. And now over to Ben. Ben? Hello? Thanks, Doug. Also in the paleontology news this week is a very cool study that has surveyed over 2,000 vertebrate fossils from a particular quarry in Colorado, which is part of the Jurassic Morrison Formation, finding that an unusually high percentage of the fossilised bones had at least one bite from a theropod dinosaur. More bones had bites in this quarry even compared to other sites in the Morrison, seeming to suggest this was an especially stressed ecosystem, and by examining striations on the bone left by some bite marks, the researchers were able to tell that most of these markings matched the denticles on the teeth of Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. However, there is also a bite mark that indicates a significantly larger theropod was present here too, potentially a huge Allosaurus, or Saurophaganax, or Torvosaurus. The paper states that the positioning of the bite marks hints that most of these were instances of scavenging, not active hunting, and that some of them likely preserve the first known evidence of Allosaurus cannibalism, with striations that match either Allosaurus or Ceratosaurus teeth being found on Allosaurus bones. And even if they're actually Ceratosaurus bite marks, then it's still the first example of this dinosaur feeding on another large theropod from its time. Finally, there's also been a study this week that's used a biophysiological modelling software to look at the metabolic functions of the Triassic dinosaurs Coelophysis and Plateosaurus during the global greenhouse conditions at the time they lived. Testing a range of assumptions in various different climate models, this analysis found support for elevated ratite-like metabolic rates and intermediate monotreme-like core temperature ranges. The researchers then conclude from these results that small theropods would likely have needed partial to full epidermal insulation to live in temperate conditions, whereas the larger sauropodomorphs would have been getting heat stressed in more open and hot environments, and instead would have kept to cooler microclimates such as forests or higher elevations and latitudes. Another very interesting study. Back to Doug in the studio. Thanks, Ben. Anyway. That's it for 7 Days of Science this week. I do hope you enjoyed and feel free to subscribe to learn more from us. And as always, we'll see you on Sunday.